hello, hello, friends, leaders, and investors. This is your host of the Better Than Success podcast, Nicole Purvey, and I have an amazing interview in store for you. This interview is so good. Rachel, a diehard Philadelphian and avid animal lover, is Pritzker Law Group's founder and chief executive officer. She is one of the city's only zoning and land use attorneys with experience in both the private sector and local government. Prior to starting PLG with her twin brother, Adam, shout out to Adam, Rachel worked at Center City Law Firm, Zarwin Baum. While at Zarwin, Rachel practiced zoning, land use, and public finance, working on multi-million dollar bond issuances and securing variances with government approvals for single family and multifamily homes, nonprofit, and some of the city's most notable high rises. After years in the private sector, Rachel transitioned over to the public sector, accepting a position with city council. As legislative counsel to city councilman at large, Alan Dom, Rachel developed legislation working with members of city council, city agencies, the mayor's administration, and mastered the policies and procedures of our city. Rachel was one of the first 27 commissioners appointed by the Mayor's Commission for Women and currently serves on its entrepreneurship working group. Welcome to the podcast, Rachel. Thank you. It doesn't even sound like me. I know. (laughs) Isn't it like daunting when someone reads off your bio? You're like, kind constantly you're judging yourself yeah. like I'm like I did do that but I sound like I should be 65 <laughs> yes you have a very 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 impressive thank you bio thank you so okay I've read off your bio why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself in your own words okay so um I'm a zoning and land use attorney my brother will kill me for saying this I specialize in zoning and land use we are a real estate development firm we do like start to finish real estate development government relations um, and we do a lot of work with the city, the city agencies, and people who are just beginning in development all the way through um, very f- sophisticated developers, and we're kind of a one-stop shop for real estate development in the city and anything city-related. So why would he kill you? Because he always says, like, people only think we do zoning, and, like, we don't only do zoning, but that's kind of where my bread and butter was. So when I decided to leave my job, I was like, that's the one skill set um, as far as the law and real estate is concerned that I'm really good at and I'm really sure of. And when you go out on your own to do something, you don't just want to, a lot of people start them from the general practice. Mm-hmm. They'll take anything. Mm-hmm. They'll take MedMal. They'll t- take PI. They'll do leases. I was specialized in zoning. I'm like, I know how to do this really, really well. And mm-hmm. if I'm going to distinguish myself, I've got to be really good at something so and most of the people that have mentored me have been really really good at something so So, okay I'm glad you said that because I didn't know that you guys did everything I thought you were just zoning no so we do everything real estate related including litigation Um, we've expanded our practice since its inception Uh, we're almost two years old so we've grown in that time we've added more lawyers Uh, we have a whole host of advisors which is honestly what's helped us grow as quickly as possible when you have a lot of smart people behind you that you can call and say I'm not sure about this or can you weigh in on that Um, and me and Adam are not uh, egocentric in that manner we'd rather get you the right information and say we're not sure let's look into it instead of you know a lot of lawyers will just give you some suggestion and you know we we have people who help us which is wonderful right 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 so that's awesome um Rachel and I had a conversation offline before we started mm-hmm. talking about your quick growth in two yeah. years and how you've got yeah. staff and lawyers and mm-hmm. all of that. Tell us about that whole experience, just growing really fast. So when we started, I left my job first. I was getting like uh, agita or just like you know, just uncomfortable mm-hmm. in my job. I felt like my growth was stifled and I like to bring a certain energy into work every day. I said to Nicole, you know, you're only here once in this life. <laughs> so you got to just wake up and kill it every day. Right. So I decided I wanted to leave and it was just me. So I was just in my apartment. My brother helped with everything QuickBooks related, uh, back of the office related, but he worked a full-time job while I d- decided to leave. He joined me six months later and it was just me and him either in his apartment or my apartment. Um, and then we moved to an office and it was just me and him in this little office. And now it's us and another attorney and a full-time admin and a full-time billing person uh, and a paralegal and we're about to um, bring on other lawyers Uh, so it's like going from just you wake every day and do what you have to do and if I'm not doing it Adam's doing it Mm -hmm. to like having to manage other people and making sure there's a culture element to it we've been spending some time on like culture and vision and Mm -hmm. mission because you want to make sure that people are aligned Mm -hmm. with your goals Um, and we want it to be kind of more of a fun open collaborative space but like work really hard like it's not 
you know, fun in the sense that you can kind of slack off during the day, work really, really hard, but play really hard as well. So um, it's, we didn't, we did not expect it to go this, um, this well so soon. So it's managing all that. And then infrastructure, you have to get technology in place. Mm -hmm. You have to get systems and processes in place and you only know what you know. So I'm not like a systems and process expert. I have right. to go reach out to other people and then you have to try things out and nothing's per per like perfectly custom to your business. So, um, a lot of growth and a lot of challenge in the last two years, but I wouldn't be anywhere else, honestly. Yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm super proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> I, Thank I, you. I meant to say this to you. So many people, like if I post you for like when you did a class for BTS uh -huh. and then I posted you for something else, I don't remember what it was. And like five people were like, Rachel or Pritzker, she's amazing. Yeah, I'm like, she you. is. So you're like a little celebrity. In oh, well, thank you. <laughs> I, I think just like being nice and working mm -hmm. really hard and I'm like, I'm very good at what I do because I work really hard at it. Like when people are out, you know, um, with friends or like, you know, I'm a very calculated person. So like when I spend time with people, it's because um, either I can add value to them, they can add value to me. There's some, you know, group benefit. Or a lot of times I'm just like reading about my practice. I'm honing it every day. I study people who are way better than me mm -hmm. at a lot of different things. And um, I think being good at what you do, being a nice person while you do it and being really honest. Like I've built a really honest practice. Like I'll tell you, here's how you get through this. Here's what not to do. Um, I don't ever um, put aside my ethics or my morals. And I know some people will do that. Um, you know, I don't, not going to name a lawyer that I know that does it, but I just in general, people will do that or they'll take your money and they, you know, they don't feel, don't feel like you're getting all the value. So mm -hmm. me and Adam are just genuinely good people. And it starts with that and empathy and wanting to help. And then, um, I think that's, what's allowed us to, uh, really have a good okay. reputation right. and Philly's really small. Very. I mean, we so. grew up in especially the suburbs. In real yeah. Especially in real estate mm -hmm. and center city and I have red hair. So like, I can't really blend in <laughs> that well. Uh, and you're so, at City Hall every Thursday. I'm at City Hall a lot. <laughs> and, you know, I worked for Alan Dom, who a mm -hmm. lot of people, you know, in real estate especially really um, respect. And I'm, He's speaking at Philly Real Estate Week. Yeah, he was there last year too. Yeah. Yeah, he's the best. I mean, I've heard the speeches a million times, mm -hmm. but uh, I still get like captivated by him. And for me, it's just like an honor to have to work with someone who's like such a genuinely good person and who is so smart. I mean, he's like insanely smart, which is you know, amazing. So <laughs> I'm, I'm glad people like what we're doing and yeah, that'll keep us around for a long time. So, okay. Why don't you tell me about like the decision to expand from zoning to doing real estate? Yeah. Just, you know, mm -hmm. really kind of take a step back because usually it's all about niching down, but you guys mm -hmm. niched up. Yeah. I well, guess, it's like growing within a safe space. So like I'll take on things that I feel competent. So the, like the criteria for lawyers to do legal work is just like being competent, which is like a very loose standard but the alternative is that you just can take on, like, I mean, realistically, anyone can be competent in almost anything. You mm -hmm. have to research it, spend time with it. But for me, like, I like to win. I like to deliver a good result. I like people to feel like I'm bringing a lot of value. Um, when you work in development, you're dealing with people's money. You're dealing mm -hmm. with banks' money. You're dealing with tight timelines. I'm working with the city. I spent a lot of years building relationships with people in the city. So anything I bring, it has to, you know, directly relates to my relationship with them or how they view me mm -hmm. and then how I can help validate the client. So we grew in a way that made sense for what our practice was. We weren't like, oh, all of a sudden let's go take on something completely, you know, off center. Like let's do, you know, complex, um, personal injury or med mal, or mm -hmm. let's go do like, you know, trucking law. Like it wasn't, it was like someone would bring me a case that was sort of related to what you know, I know how to do. And I was like, well, if I can just apply that skill set. And again, like I said, I have advisors. So there's other lawyers that I have built, um, bridges with mm -hmm. through my career. A lot of people will leave jobs and they burn bridges with people mm -hmm. or they don't keep up. I'm so relationship focused. My brother will, uh, vouch for that. I spend a lot of time creating genuine relationships with people, not just let me ask you for a favor, but doing things that people don't ask for and making connections with people where I'll benefit not at all, or maybe we benefit down the line, but it's not, that's not what the focus is. Mm -hmm. So I call people and I'll say, Hey, I just took on this case. Like, would you help me? Um, we've also developed, we built a consulting firm at the same time. So we could pay people, um, who weren't lawyers, um, through our consulting practice who have a lot of political expertise or are really good at something specific but not related to law um, where they add value to any of our cases that we work in and then we give referral fees you, you just treat people right and right. they'll help you so that, that's a good point about not burning bridges because mm -hmm. I, I've mentioned this on the podcast before 
and a lot of our listeners have nine to fives and they're trying to get out of their nine to five Mm -hmm. and you daydream all day like when i leave this place i'm gonna tell everybody f you right Mm -hmm. but when i started my business or became an entrepreneur nine years ago and i fast forward to today some of the people that are my loyal customers that have patronized every business that I've had in the past nine years mm-hmm. are people that I worked with yeah. when I had a regular job. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So you got to make sure that, you know, as you're making your transition, that you are mindful of those connections. Right. Yeah. You don't need to. People tell also always ask you, like, where'd you work? And then they're like, oh, do you know so and so? And then they'll talk, you know, people like to, you know, and again, with our point with Philly being really small, um, I don't know. It was always important for me to like, I, I, my mom's Buddhist and I believe in karma. I think the way that you treat people comes back at you and the way that people treat you comes back at them. Mm -hmm. So I just was always like, let me not burn a bridge unless like it was really worth burning. Like unless I was felt really disrespected Mm -hmm. or I felt like, you know, they, um, really stepped out of line, but I think it's just easier to just remove that person from your life instead of making a whole stink about it. But I've had people that I work with mistreat me. I mean, I've had, I've been very loyal to places I've worked and not had the same but for me it was like it, it's about vision not sight it's mm-hmm. about seeing a bigger picture and you probably end up uh always being glad that you didn't burn a bridge or tarnish your reputation because even if it's deserved um the way you like speak to someone or whatever it always comes back on you right right so even if you're you know and you can respectfully not like people without you know causing a stink so right so let's talk about the transition from when you had a regular job mm-hmm. to starting your yeah. first practice or two years ago when it was just you. Okay. How did that transition go? When What made you decide, make the decision and what was that experience like? So like, I think there's never a good time, but it's it was like, I kind of watched all the other people that I know that um, practice zoning or that are real estate attorneys. And I was like, I can definitely do that. Like, you know, mm-hmm. so my old boss, Darwin Beauvais, who like I adore, he works at Dilworth and he was really the one who exposed me to um, zoning and land use and to like government at all because he'd worked for a council member um, mm-hmm. before he was working at the firm we, uh, we were at at Zarwin. And he literally was like, you know, you get to a point where you're like the emperor has no clothes. Like you realize that like you can do just as good or just as much or different. And it wasn't like I was like, oh, I'm better than all these. I was just like, I bring a different energy. Like I'm female, first of all. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that practice zoning or big in real estate are all men. And I was like, okay, so clearly there's a niche for that because not everyone wants to hire, you know, like a super aggressive man. Like that's not my energy that, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I was like, there's just a way to move with politics and with real estate development that I don't see people moving. Like Mm -hmm. I just, I see it being really adversarial. I see it being super controversial. And I'm not saying that like, I'm going to clean all that up and it's going to, but I just think I can see it differently than Mm -hmm. other people so my thought was like I think I was like 28 I'm 30 now I was like all right like if I don't do it now like what am I going to do and I didn't have like a go-to like I wanted to leave my job working for the councilman but I didn't like want to go somewhere else it Mm -hmm. wasn't like I had this great job lined up and that's why I left a lot of people like they'll find another job I just was like I can't I know I can't work here anymore but I don't want to go back to a big firm there's not like really a developer I want to work for or So I just was like, let me see for like six months. It's like the deadline I gave myself, six months. See if I can do it. And I talked to my brother about it and my dad. And my brother was like, "Um, I don't really think there's like any space for that. Like, I don't, I don't think. Really? Yeah. Yeah, He was like, I don't think you can make a career of that. That's what Adam said to me. But he, you know, he didn't have too much. He was on the zoning board as counsel, but he didn't like, he wasn't a zoning lawyer. So he was like, I don't, I think there's like three guys that do it. I think they're covering the whole market. And I don't think, and I was like, all right, well, let me like, so we worked some numbers out and I was like, let me, he's like, what I'll do is I'll support you financially while you do it. Like Aww. I'll pay for your QuickBooks and I'll help you with your software, do your invoicing. <laughs> and my brother's like frugal. I mean, he's like, I'm like, Adam, like we need water. He's like, no, no, we're okay. <laughs> like, you know, he's just, and me, I'm like, e- new sweatshirts for everyone. He's like, no, like he always is like saying no to stuff with me, like monetarily. Cause I'm just always of abundance, even if it's, I don't have abundance. That right. Way. I'm the same way. I'm, I'm like, yeah. absolutely. If, it, need if I need chairs. it, it'll make a way. Yeah, yeah. I'm always <laughs> like, worry about it, it later. <laughs> yeah, right. He, so he was like, yeah, I'll pay for the whole thing. And like, if if we get some traction, then like, we'll see. So we gained some traction. And he was like, okay. So we we jumped. We were, it was like, once you like step your toes in, 
there's, there's no, no turning back right and i'm like a zero or a thousand person like mm-hmm. everyone who knows me will be like there's no middle ground with rachel like it's either black or white like i'm either what's obs- your sign which, which- i'm a pisces pisces so i'm like super emotional very sensitive mm-hmm. um but i'm like edgy at mm-hmm. the same time like you don't want to be on my bad side I'm a Taurus and I'm exactly okay. that way. That's why I asked you that. Yeah. It's either zero or, or a hundred. I mean, right. with everything. I'm either in love with it or just like, I'm not interested. Right. Or like, I hate right. it. Right. Yeah. I'm the same way. Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, let's do this. And it was really scary. I mean, like really scary. You're just like, kind of like reaching out to all your contacts. And like, I hadn't tapped into anyone. Like I never had a job where like I needed to, like mm-hmm. I needed to really leverage my contacts or like reach out to my parents and be like, who do you know? Or like, you know, I never, I just stored all these relationships and all these contacts and I never used them Mm. ever. So then when I did, I was like, I don't know why, maybe I was like mentally just like saving them in one day. Mm -hmm. But then I reached out to like everyone I knew. I was like, let me just spend the next like six months meeting with everyone. I met with every RCO, registered community organization you could meet with in the city. I was like, if I'm going to play in politics, like I'm going to really really know this stuff. Like we're going to, yeah, like I'm, I'm, I always say like I'm someone you can go to war with like I'm prepared like I'm hungry and I'm driven and I'll just do whatever it is you know within certain boundaries to make sure I know what I'm talking about so we did that and we had a million coffees at um that we didn't have an office and we didn't want to be like we don't have an office (laughs) so we went to the coffee shop on like uh where is that 16th and Walnut, the Capital One Cafe? Mm-hmm. Shout out to Capital One Cafe. Thanks for the, for helping oh, us yeah, for oh, helping us start right. our yes, business. Yes, yes, yes. Oh yeah, we and it was so funny because we had, we met with this really really big um, business guy in real estate, like huge guy, and he was like, he was like, listen, I I love that we met here. He was like, I'm so tired of walking in lawyers' offices with conference room. Little did he know we didn't even have an office <laughs> with a conference room. But we were like, oh yeah, we're just more in this low key vibe. Like we're, we're millennials. Just, yeah, this is what yeah, we do. Love it here. <laughs> So um, we reached out to everyone and we like we woke up every day and we just went after it. And my dad was my dad was a very successful businessman. And Mm -hmm. he said to me that he talked to a lot of guys who were like very, very, very successful, bigger than my dad ever was. And they said he said, like, what's your sauce? Like, what's the secret sauce? Like, how do you he go? They said you wake up every day. You have a vision for what you want to do and you work at it every day, Mm -hmm. every day. Mm hmm. And that's what we did Mm -hmm. every day we woke up and we didn't know exactly, you know, how long we had to go make this work, but every day we worked at it. And there's two of me. God gave me a twin. That's a beautiful thing. And he works like I work. So I do want to point out something to you listeners that she said. um, And she said that her brother supported her. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so here's the thing, right? A lot of us may not have someone that supports us, but that doesn't mean that you can't support someone who has a dream because Mm -hmm. Your brother supported you mm-hmm. and then it ended up helping him leave his job. Yeah. Right? Yeah, absolutely. So keep an open mind. It's beautiful when we have people support us, right? It's a blessing. I always talk about how, like, when I moved back to Philly, I'm really thankful that my parents or my family had a spare house mm-hmm. so I could be an entrepreneur and keep, you know, a low, you know, my expenses low. Yeah. And I lived for free. Yeah. So n- not a lot of us have that, but that doesn't mean that you can't do that for someone else Mm -hmm. because you never know the thing that you end up supporting may end up feeding you. Unless it's a really bad idea. Then just be like, this is a really bad idea. Like unless someone's trying to do like, Oh yeah, I'm going to create like a skincare line. It's exactly like Neutrogena, but it's going to be called Blutrogena. You know, like then it's like, I think that's not, there's no market for that, but yeah, no, definitely support people because life is really short and they may have a really good idea. And you might be the reason they decide to, if if I'd gone to Adam and he was like, Nope, I think this is terrible. I'm not going to help you out. I'm not going to do anything. Like I don't want to be involved. I don't know where I'd be. Right. I probably would be back at a law firm just churning away dying. hours. Yeah. Dying. Slowly so. dying. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I want to say to you, if you are thinking about becoming a member of the Better Than Success Real Estate League, the monthly membership is going to be going up after this week. So here's how it works. Whatever you come in at, you're grandfathered in forever and ever and ever and ever. I told everybody we're going to go up to eventually $99 a month. We're not there yet. Well, we're definitely there in value, (laughs) but I've just been creeping the price up. So the price is not there yet. So whatever you come in at, you will be grandfathered in. So if you are thinking about signing up, just go to betterthansuccess.com forward slash B-T-S-R-E-L. B is in beta, T is in tango, S is in Sam, R is in real estate. 
E as in estate, L as in Lima. So it's basically BTS Real Estate League, right? So betterthansuccess.com forward slash B-T-S-R-E-L. And then you can learn about the league there and you can go ahead and sign up and take advantage and lock in at the price that we're at now. So, okay, let's talk about just, you know, real estate. What are some of the common, I mean, so you have a wide variety of clients, right? Mm -hmm. You have some of the top investors in Philly, Mm -hmm. and then you have some regular everyday investors Mm -hmm. like me. And then some nonprofits. And some nonprofits. Mm -hmm. What are some of the common things that you see in terms of real estate law or that they're calling you for? So like the main thing we always get hit with is like, do I set up an LLC like bottom up? Like, so just bottom up for people who are not super sophisticated. Do I set up an LLC? Do I do it on my own name? Do I need an operating agreement? So a lot of people ask you that. Oh yeah. Really? And we always say like, get an LLC. Right. Because protection and liability, like lawyers are, are live to be like, no, like it's illegal or let's like, or, you know, here's a million paragraphs you don't really need to help protect you from this, that, and the third. So we get stuff that people are like, how do I start? Or like, I have this property that I want to develop one of like basic things like that. So we help like super basic issues and then all the way up to people who are like, I just got hit with this week. Like my one, what will be my biggest, uh, development project yet? A giant shopping center. Um, Knock on wood that I close this deal. Mm-hmm. I got to get them a proposal. Mm-hmm. Um, but a huge shopping center where we've got to move a whole bunch of alleyways and we got to get through a civic design review, which is a whole city process that involves um, going in front of the planning commission and a bunch of other people to show the project um, from a more of an aesthetic and architectural standpoint. Um, when there's a project of a certain size, you have to go through what's called CDR, civic design review. Usually if, um, 50 units and above or 100,000 new square feet. Um, things like that. So we have a really big project. And, and you have it, to go in front of the planning commission? Yeah, it's the CDR board, which involves people from the planning commission, someone from the registered community organization. There's a couple other board members um, mm-hmm. as well. And you present your that. project and they critique it from an aesthetic standpoint. It's more of an architectural conversation than it is a legal oh. one. But when you have a project that big, you know, you want they want to make sure that it's going to look okay. You know, they don't want like metal siding and like orange and you know they want to make sure it's appropriate for the area. What about I don't know why I thought about this. Do yeah. you know that project is um apartments in West Philly. I don't know the name of the street, but it's literally it's probably like it looks like it's like 50 or 100 units. Okay. But it's white and orange. I wish I knew which street it was. Yeah, does it have like a whole bunch of different colors on it too? Yes. It looks like a prison sort of. It's horrible. Like a colorful How one. I'm sorry. The first, yeah. Um <laughs> It's horrible. Well, yeah, I don't know if they went through CDR. They built it in phases. I know exactly what you're talking about. I actually know the developer. Um, A colleague of mine works with them um, from a political space. Uh, They're like an ethnicity. I don't want to say like, they're like the group of people that are like a certain ethnicity. Yes, yes. It's a, I think it's affordable too, right? It's like, it's affordable housing or, you know, so, and I don't know when it went through CDR, didn't go through CDR and it probably, because it's not really centrally located, they didn't care as much or who knows, maybe they Mm. loved it. Um, And because also because it's affordable, sometimes I guess the materials you can use are probably limited because they have to keep costs down. And so who knows, but I have a 300 unit project we're doing now that we're about to go to CDR in May. And that'll be really, really exciting. Uh, so how much do, this is super new to me. I did not know yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, which makes sense to me. Yeah. But if you're that you have that a, big, yeah. a committee, a board of people that have a vested interest in mm-hmm. the city, right? Mm-hmm. To make sure that people are not putting up crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, how, how much, how much are the designs on the chopping block? Like, are they really critiquing it? Yeah. Or? I mean, it depends who your architect is. Mm-hmm. So like some architects are really creative. Um, we work a lot with a group called Design Blends, who mm-hmm. I love to work with because they're young and they're hungry and they're driven and they're creative and they're legitimately very fun to work with. So mm-hmm. when you work on some of these projects where some of the other aspects of it may not be fun, it's nice to have a team together that's fun. But they, um, for for the big project I'm doing that's uh, th- almost 300 units, we I reviewed the whole file of a project that was right next door that proposed a similar amount of units that the community really didn't like. So I, we looked at that and we designed it based off of what the community had said that they wanted based on, you know, limitations with our site. We have some issues with our site that we can't address, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's really architectural. They, they, and it's advisory CDR. 
like the RCO process is also advisory technically, but in our city we're political. So we really, it really matters. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's advisory in the sense that like, you don't have to make the changes, but then again, you go to the zoning board. If you have, you know, if you're getting variances and that same person from planning commission is sitting in front of the zoning board. So you don't want to be like, Oh, we really loved your suggestion, Suzanne, but, and that's not the person's name. I'm just giving a fake name, but like, and here we are again, like, please say yes. You know? So, and truthfully, I mean, the goal is to get people to yes. Like my job is really to like, get people to yes in the quickest way possible with you know as much um like honesty and transparency as humanly possible without breaching attorney client privilege and you have some developers like don't say anything and some who are just like "Eh, say what you want to say but to your point about you know um some of the big issues we face a lot of questions about variances or properties that were zoned incorrectly i'm doing a project now fishtown property the owners bought it it's a duplex it was never legally zoned for a duplex Mm -hmm. I get that all the time. Okay. People illegally convert properties um, or I want to put a daycare in or I want to put this restaurant in or I want to do multifamily. It's a vacant lot. Can I do that? And we do quick analysis for people, very cost efficient so that we can tell you what you can build as of right. And if you want to go through the variance process, if it's worth your time. So let me ask you a question. This is um, what is the difference between getting something rezoned and getting a variant? So people like to use the word like rezoned, which means like people will say, can I rezone it to RM1? Mm-hmm. Well, there's only two things you can do. You either get a variance or you get what's called a legislative remapping, which is like rezoning. Mm-hmm. You can't, there's no, this, this word like rezone basically means one of those two. Mm-hmm. Um, most typically a variance, which means that process where we submit to LNI, we get a refusal, we go meet with the community, we explain the project, we hope that they don't hate it, we then provide this information to the zoning board and hopefully they say yes. That's a, that's a variance, meaning you can vary from the code either use-wise or dimensionally. So it's zoned single family, I want a variance. Like people would say I want a variance for RM1, what they mean is they want to use the property for multifamily. A remapping is actually a legislative ordinance that has to get passed through city council by the council member whose district that is to change the zoning maps of the city in the city's like plans and database to change it. So it physically on the zoning map in Atlas, Mm -hmm. atlas Mm -hmm. atlas.phila.gov from like RSA five to RM one. That's a legislative process. And a council member um, usually does not do spot zoning, meaning they don't pick one parcel on the corner of one, two, three, four main street. And they sometimes they'll, they will remap large areas of the city if they want to incentivize or, you know, not incentivize certain types of development. So we're seeing in brewery town, Um, a lot of remapping to residential single family instead of RM1 because of all the density and the concerns that the council office may be getting about issues that, you know, um, result from building too much density too quickly, Mm -hmm. like trash and parking and Mm -hmm. things like that. Other times, like they'll remap it a whole corridor into commercial because they want to um, incentivize people to build commercial. We Mm -hmm. actually have something called the Philadelphia 2035 Comprehensive Plan. Mm -hmm. Um, which actually states out um, 18 different districts. We only have 10 districts in the city, but they break it down into 18 Mm -hmm. smaller ones. And they have a plan for that area of what they'd like to see based on conversations with the community and the planning commission and the council offices and and other members of the mayor's administration and the different offices. So they weigh in. We want Girard Avenue to be a commercial corridor. The best zoning for that, you know, would be CMX two or two and a half or, you know. So when you're looking on Atlas, Mm -hmm. so, Okay. Now Atlas, just, just so for people who are listening, Atlas is like whenever someone calls our office and is like, I have a question about a property, the first thing I do is, check Atlas. is to Atlas and then the council member map because people underutilize the council offices. There, There's one council member for each district in the mm-hmm. city and there's a great map on the council website that you can literally type in your address, find and who the council member is. Name. Even if you have issues, I had someone call me yesterday. It was like, there's all this hammering. I don't know if the people have a permit. Who do I call? I'm like... They're like, I don't want to call LNI myself because I'm like scared that the person will come after me. And I was like, call the council office and talk to them about it and see. Because the council members, it's their responsibility to work with their constituents. That's right. That's you know, their who, job. Yeah, that's who they support right. and that's who votes for them. And that's, you know, that's what they're, those elected officials are and there it, for. And I have so many things to touch on based on all that. Most people don't know that. They treat yeah. council members like... 
celebrities. Right. And it's like, and they, no, they work for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, and they, they are a celebrity in the city in the sense that there's one for each district. Right. I mean, there's just one person, you know, like Maria Canona Sanchez. She's the councilwoman for the seventh district. She's the go to for the seventh district. So it's a blessing and a curse because she has a lot of power and she, ha- in order to legislate and make policy, but also she has a lot of responsibility. She, ha- you know, she has a lot of people mm-hmm. that she has to listen to and pay attention to and make sure that things are moving or not moving and has to you know be is the end all be all for things that go in in her district and things like that so it's people are like oh my gosh about council members but it's a really hard job yeah I, it's a really really hard job yeah so but they yeah they work they work for you because your tax dollars go to pay their salaries and same with their staff and you know same with the mayor and his administration and all the city agencies that's where taxpayer dollars go mm-hmm. to things that service the city as a whole right so okay let's talk about go back to this atlas and the variance yes. so if you get a variance it won't show on atlas no um it would under the tab that says l and i there's a tab that says licenses and inspections where yeah. it will say like zoning archives or zoning history if you click on it it should have every permit that has ever been approved for that specific property if you don't see it there it probably doesn't exist unless it was just recently granted and then you know obviously it takes a while to update the systems um, but, but when you get a variance, that's temporary, right? You have no, to, well, so it, it runs with the property mm-hmm. and it goes away. If you can show it was abandoned, meaning either we completely demoed the building mm-hmm. or if you replaced it with a new use or if, um, like there's been actual times where people have written in letters and have deemed the use abandoned because it hasn't been used that way for like 10 years or five years or, but as long as you're like, it's an active use in some sort of yeah, a way okay. or that the building isn't being, um, like for instance, I had a client call me this week. He said to me, we just got a variance. He was working with another lawyer, which is all fine. I'll still take the call. <laughs> I have the she rest wanted of to it. immediately hang I'm, up. I'm, no, I have the, he's an awesome developer. And I was like, why did you use that guy? He's like, it's before I met you. <laughs> So I said, oh, you're calling me to ask about it. Why don't you call your lawyer? And he's like, he didn't answer the phone. I'm like, yep. And that people always say that about me and I, we always answer the phone. Like if it's, you know, if I'm like sitting at someone's, you know, birthday or bat mitzvah, I'm not going to a lot about mitzvahs, but if I was, <laughs> I would still, <laughs> still pick up the phone. Uh, he called me and he said, we just got a variance approval for this multifamily for three units on an RSA five lot, but it was an existing building that was already built out. He said, I went in and I now need to renovate it because now I have the permits. And he said, I went in, it was in really bad condition and I need to demo it. Am I going to lose my zoning? I said, yeah. So I said, try to use the existing structure as much as possible because otherwise you have to go back through the variance process again. So how, how do they know though? I guess when you go to get your permits, then mm-hmm. they know. For building, they, they check. Re- mm-hmm. oh. And if you get rental licenses, sometimes they'll check to make sure that your zoning is in place. Sometimes they don't no, check. Man, how will they know in order to do away with the variance? How do they know? Well, then when he would go, so say he demoed it, mm-hmm. he got the zoning approval for it. What your next step is zoning and then building permits, right? So if he then went to just demo the whole thing, he's, you know, and then have to go back through to get building permits, he has to submit new plans because now it's new construction. It's not yeah, an addition yeah. or an alteration of new construction. They would see that, you know, oh, you don't have, because you're you're changing what you're doing. Your scope is different. Mm. So when people say ninety nine percent of the time when they say they're getting it rezoned, they really mean they're getting, they're getting a variance. Variance, variance uh. is a lot quicker. Um, and the reason a lot of council members prefer to do a variance, um, aside from re- a remapping, is because it has to go in front of the community, and it's um, easier for them to support something if they know that it was went in front of the community they got a say in it they were able to you know weigh in on it or at least be able to see what the new project was but if, if you get a remapping that doesn't have to go no you don't need it. any you don't it's just completely legislative so it's the council member um, um, as long as the council member introduces it and they get the required votes which is nine votes um, and it moves through the process you have to have a hearing for it i mean there's some procedural stuff that has yeah, to I'm, happen I'm, i've never done it before so mm-hmm. i didn't know any of this we've done it for like big projects um like really big projects that affect a lot of and ones that like you're not like the council member won't do it if they think that like you know it makes no sense for the mm-hmm. council members are not really like they're not uh, they're not developer friendly it's not that they're not developer friendly. It's just that they're cautious. I mean, because they have to answer to everything that happens 
you know, like good and bad. And Mm -hmm. so it's not that they're not development friendly. Of course, they want to improve their districts. They want to have amenities. They want responsible development. But they also have to balance the concerns of hundreds of thousands of people that they're responsible for. Like, you know, and we don't have um, a crazy amount of turnover. So you're seeing the same council members, you know, every four years and every four years, it's the same people. So they can't hide. I mean, they can't hide. They're there. Their office is in City Hall. Um, they're out in the communities a lot of times doing outreach and cleanups and they do different kinds of like town halls and like, so they're they're very visible to people. By the um, way, guys, um, if you live in Philly, uh, election is coming up. Yeah. May 21st. May so 21. Make sure, that, make sure that you vote. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you see how important. I always tell yeah. you guys that the government on the local level is more impactful to your life than the federal government. So you definitely must make sure. Yeah. And the primary is the most important in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Uh, The kind of like unwritten rule is that if you win the primary, you win the general. Mm -hmm. Um, So May 21st is really important. And there's information about um, each council member online. There's uh, seven at large members that you get to elect and then, you know, 10 district council members. Mm -hmm. So so yeah, make sure that you go out and vote. We're gonna have actually um, Isaiah Thomas on the podcast. Okay, and then we're also going to have Kathy Gilmore on the podcast. Okay, so yeah, I was a staffer when she was a staffer too. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. she's wonderful, and I recently linked up with Isaiah, who I think is great as well. Yeah, they're both running for a city council at large positions. Yeah. So um, okay, that was really really informative. I did yeah, not know politics. all of that. Huh? A lot of politics. Yes, I I listen. Yeah. I totally respect you for just being in politics but not in politics yeah. if I had time I would yeah. every day every Thursday on my calendar I have to go to city council and it's never have you gotta come with me it's a I good know. time it's legitimately a good time I mean our city legislates every Thursday uh they vote and they introduce new legislation and you probably want to know the kind of stuff that may or may not especially in real estate that's the most controversial topic that there is that's the one that affects people you know the most especially in our field um, and we track that legislation in our office. I have some developers that like love certain pockets mm-hmm. or certain people who are like, hey, I only really play in this space. Will you let me know if a bill that's going to remap the area comes through so that I can know to pull permits ahead of time? Because mm-hmm. there's a time frame that you can, if your property is going to get rezoned to or, you know, to RSA 5, there's a window in which you can get your permits submitted. And we track that for people. Um, and we track all the legislation really that affects uh, real estate as much as possible so that we can tell, you know, advise people. I get hit up about Airbnb all the time. That's like a huge thing in the city. And we have legislation that doesn't really uh, cover all the bases. Mm-hmm. Almost. It was introduced actually when uh, the Pope came to town because mm-hmm. a lot of people were like Airbnb mm-hmm. in their places. And a good friend of mine is actually represents the hotel association that was really involved with like that legislation. So we get asked a lot about how to do Airbnb. Airbnb legally um if I'm an investor and I buy a property can I Airbnb it what Um, is the what is the rule for Airbnb? you have to live at the property you have to be an actual like resident of the property you have to be the primary owner um you can only do it for a certain amount of days without getting um, hotel well so you have to get what's called a limited lodging license which if you're doing it for more than there's two tiers it's like maybe like don't quote me on this like 190 days or more than 180 days with no more than 30 days consecutively you have to get a limited lodging license um but you also if you don't live in the property and you like you own it but you're renting it out they can only the people who are renting it out can only rent it out for airbnb for six months so you couldn't have just a plate technically you couldn't have a place that just is only airbnb for like years and years like it it doesn't work like that but it it might need to be revisited i mean i just said it was implemented during your eyes are crazy right now well no (laughs) yes my eyes are very crazy because okay so i have so many questions about that i was about to like wind this down but i have so many questions about that because um i'm trying to see how much of this i can say i was just recently in on a meeting it and it wasn't this project is not in philadelphia so i will say that so it may be completely different in this place um, where they have a large, they're building a large development. And the idea is that they want people to rent, but 90% of the time they can Airbnb it. Mm-hmm. And this place it's, is if almost it's not done. In Philly, I don't know if right. it's in Philly. I do know, but, um, 
So you, you can't can just get, buy a place in Philly well, you that can you don't you, live in yeah, and say unless it's Airbnb visitor all the time. Unless it's visitor accommodations. So visitor accommodations is a different use than multifamily. Mm-hmm. Visitor accommodations is like technically like a hotel-ish use. Mm-hmm. It's for like short-term living, so like 30 days or less. Um, and that, But that's only really in like the higher commercial um, zoning districts, so like your CMX threes and fours right. and five, which right. a lot of property is not. That's mostly concentrated in Center City, and there's some, there's some in, in other areas, but that's not like a really popular. Those are those are the best commercial class pieces you, you, that you can get. So, so the best, okay. So if you want to do Airbnb, the best thing is to get like a quad. You live in one of the units because you say you have to live there. Yes, has to be your primary residence. Does the actual unit have to be your primary residence, or can you be like, I live in this quad, and then all the other? Yeah, you can, units? but you, uh, depending on how many consecutive days you run it out, you would have to go get a limited lodging uh, use certificate, and then your other option, and then again, you can only do it for that time frame, and then you can only do it for if if they're le- if so if it's not your place and you have other ones you own that are being leased out, you only can do it for six months technically, so. Um, but the problem also is, is like Airbnb is, and also the percent it's, I think it's like 8.6% or 8.5%. Don't quote me on the exact number. I got to pull the legislation up, um, of a tax. Mm -hmm. So the tax is really high. Mm -hmm. Um, but Airbnb's, uh, website doesn't like tie in with the city's records. Mm -hmm. So like, it's very hard to check. Right. And I always say to people, there's a difference between whether you do something legally and whether it's being enforced or not. I always say, because we clean up a lot of violations, so people will say, oh, well, what if I do it? What's going to happen? Nothing might happen or something might happen. And if you get caught, you being able to actually resolve that violation, if your property isn't zoned correctly, it'll cost you more on the back end than it's worth. So I always give a disclaimer, like, I'm going to tell you what the law is, and then I can't control what you do or don't do. I'm not going to advise you to do something illegal. I'm going to give you kind of like read you your rights and then tell you how to clean it up if we I had to clean up a lot of them that's why I learned about it Mm. there were some center city buildings that were zoned incorrectly for it so for those of you who are like yeah I won't get caught here's the thing I don't ever believe in having a business that is not legally supported like you don't want to like buy a whole house and you don't have legal rights to do whatever you want to do to it like or start a business that's based on something that is super like you know Mm -hmm. frowned upon or you just don't want that hanging over you you don't want it hanging over you and yeah and if you're gonna do airbnb any moment yeah if you're gonna do airbnb just like make sure you're good with your neighbors Right. Because the people that call L and I are always the neighbors because they're upset because you're loud or the tenants are rude or there's trash everywhere or like so all that, that stuff. So that was what I was saying when I was in this meeting and they were talking about this building. And I and I, I started immediately thinking about it from a consumer standpoint, which is a great idea. Like, you know, hey, we're going to have a building that is dedicated to and they're thinking their whole they kept saying millennials. Millennials love to do short term place. Da, 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 da. And so the whole idea is you rent a place there and you can Airbnb it out for whatever. And then I'm like, this sounds like a nightmare. If I live there, I would not be happy. Mm-mm. I would not. I would, if my neighbors, I found out, like we're in my apartment right now. If I found out my neighbor was Airbnb and it had a bunch of strangers mm-hmm. come in and out, I would have a whole yeah, heart there's attack. A, there's safety issues involved. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff involved with it. I think, yeah. the, I think the legislation needs to be looked at again. Definitely. And the other thing about it, all of this stuff is like people don't, know what the rules are and but like ignorance of the law is not an excuse right right like you you know but at the same time the city should be or someone should be really explaining people what the law is a little bit better and then again like we don't have a lot of systems that operate together so sometimes it's even hard to track we have the fifth largest city in the country when people complain to me in real estate they're like well why can't we get this permit done or this that and the third i'm like you understand where the where it's 1.5 million people in the city right like not just you right so like we'll move as as fast as we can and people in government like um i have such an appreciation for people in government from working there myself a lot of people work really really hard And they just don't, you just don't have the same kind of resources or capital or um, exposure to what you have in the private sector. You don't just get a new computer. You know, you just don't get a raise when you've worked really hard because there's a whole bunch of other stuff. When I, every time I go in city hall and I go into some official's office, I'm like, this place is a dump. Oh my God. (laughs) We we ordered, at my old office when I worked for the councilman, we ordered ordered desks and uh, they're still not there. That was four years ago. I was just at his office <laughs> yeah. about a month and a half ago, and I was like, hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And like, even, not, his office, office is nicer than other people's yeah, office. Though. But even like L&I, I mean, like going L&I, like you mm-hmm. want those people to like crank out like your plans and like permits, but like their computers are like dated and the right. carpets like gross. And right. The floors are like, it's not a pleasant place to work. Right. You want those, you got to make the environment. I mean, like Google and these companies that are just like churning out talent and like really high retention and like really like happy employees. I mean, they don't look like an L&I. Right. And I'm not saying we should like blow city money on like making, you know, palm tree, like, but you have to balance the two. So before people complain, it's call our office, we'll fix it. But right. you know, uh, <laughs> that's what we love to do. That's our niche. Right. I was going to ask you something else. Um, Oh, yes. This is a popular question that comes up in the group. Um, is it legal mm-hmm. to have a new boarding house, like a rooming house? That's what your zoning is. So there is a use in the code uh, for boarding. I mean, I'm preface, for preface this houses. by saying uh, I'm not your lawyer. Mm-hmm. I'm just a lawyer mm-hmm. with experience in mm-hmm. this. So rely on it as much as you want. But there is a zoning use for uh, a boarding house or rooming um, for certain zoning classifications. I would have to pull up the code to give you the exact. Um, From what I hear, I've heard conflicting things that they don't give out variances for it anymore. So if they you- tend not to because of a lot of people were converting them illegally. Mm-hmm. A lot of the regulation that happens in government is like reactionary, like something went really wrong. And so that, that's how they react to it. Instead of sometimes we don't respond, we react. Mm-hmm. And a response is like a little bit more calm and calculated and like, but with the city, they have to move quickly because I'm sure there was something that happened where, you know, that, that collapse that happened in center city, like mm-hmm. then now they're changing all what, the way they do all these things so the same with boarding houses so people were illegally converting them and they weren't getting the proper use permits and it was really bad environments for people that they were living in i mean it was like dirty and like slum lords and like mm-hmm. that's not everyone um and there's a new model that's coming out i read an article earlier this week there's a new model of like rooming houses or boarding houses, or shared space however you want to call mm-hmm. it to make it more affordable and kind of balance out some of the costs and there is a way to do it i think it's just kind of changing the uh the vision of it and as long as you you can get a variance for anything as long, well, not anything. If you can present to the community and the council office and the board, the project in a way that people can really get behind and they feel confident in your team, in you, that they trust you, that you can carry it out, that you're transparent, um, that you're accessible to answer questions, you can get things to move a lot more. So what it's never about if, it's how. And pe- remember, people react based on their past experience with something and if they had a past experience with something negative they're going to say no people are more comfortable saying no it's easier than saying yes or asking questions right people don't like multifamily in a lot of areas you know like temple that's always the conversation is like we don't want more student housing well they had a lot of bad experiences in some areas with all the student housing all of a sudden because of the way that students some students behave treat the neighbors treat the property loud you know but that's not everybody right Mm -hmm. so the same with the boarding houses is that I don't think it can't be done. I just think if it's done responsibly and you present it in a way that people can get behind. Um, and a lot of that's just talking to neighbors. A lot of that's just really, really open with your your proposals, being open to suggestions and flexibility. That's probably the biggest thing I would say. Um, what makes like a good developer or someone in real estate is people who think outside the box and people who are willing to be flexible. Mm-hmm. You can't come in with a staunch vision of what you want to do and assume that everyone's going to stand up and clap. You just can't. Right. You have to be flexible. Yeah. Understand malleable. where your floor is. So understand mm-hmm. like, hey, I can't like I because I get the financial piece. Like some communities or some people will say like, well, we want you to do this. Like, well, we can't do that because financially we don't only have a budget for this or things like that. But having understanding like where your floor is like we need to have three units, but we maybe don't need seven. That's greedy. I don't right. need seven, you know. And so and where there's wiggle room, like if you're not married to a facade don't fight hard for like your stucco if you're okay with brick or like, you know, you know, be open to some, some things. And I think that's always beneficial. So the boarding, I think you're going to see more and more of that in Philadelphia. We tend to take some trends from New York and um, I don't think it's ever a hard no. I just think it depends on who it is. We listen, people told people at the Piazza, like that's never going to happen. What's happening. And there's more of them. Right. So that's what I would say. Somebody actually there in that same meeting, down the street from that building, mm-hmm. they're trying to, they, so I've heard Bart talk about what inspired the piazzas, him going to the, these open air mm-hmm. areas in Italy. And so 
the guy, he never mentioned Bart, but they are doing something similar near that building mm -hmm. where it's going to be like, you know, these open piazza type. Who, who type wouldn't things. want that? I know. It's really cool. Yeah. I wish they just get some better places over there yeah yeah <laughs> i would go <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but and um, i always think with projects for people too like if you're proposing something you need a variance for unless you really have a good hardship where it's like dimensional or think about like if you lived in that community like it, like take your personal like you've got money in it and you like just from a common sense like mm -hmm. with a little bit of heart and some empathy like think about it like would you want that there and if you and if you say yes, like think about why would you want that there and how do you then sell that or articulate that to the people you're talking to or think what you would want different about it. So I'm going to play devil's advocate. Sure. Sometimes people just don't like change. True. Very true. Very true. And I can see that being a lot of the case here with some communities in Philly. Mm -hmm. People don't like change. And then also the council people when they see whatever direction that the mass is going in, they'll take that side because they have to. Mm -hmm. They may not even really be that passionate about it. Yeah. So it's really kind of like some council members. I've seen come out, some council members be like, you know, all due respect to the community, but we're going to be in, we're, we're not, we're not in, we're not in support of the project, but we're not opposed to it. Got we're it. just not going to take a side because that's a more fair position for that particular case than, whatever yeah some some groups do not like change at all period and that's not like you have to you know you have to move the needle forward but sometimes it's because they've seen stuff that has been so inconsiderate mm -hmm. for an area like mm -hmm. if they're if you're getting a bad reaction you really talk to someone and you say something just the person like it hits them the toilet and you're like whoa was that really and it wasn't about you it was right. about whatever so, happened before yeah so it's just and listen at least with us i'm so transparent about like here's what we're going to come up against because i've spent time with almost every rco i have a database in my office that says this is the rco here's what they like here's what they don't like because i met with all of them before i had one client no projects on the table. I was like, just here to listen, made a database of it. And then I can say to people, Hey, this is the main, main issues, but usually they're trash parking affordability. And, you know, depending on the neighborhood facade, people want it to look and feel like something that was there before. What is anybody doing about the trash? This is like my biggest pet peeve. So it, you're only required if, if you have six units or more to get like commercial trash pickup by the city. So like some of these smaller duplexes, triplexes that are getting put up, um, the city can only do so much. The and city needs to clean itself. The city's got 982,612 other issues. In addition to trash, we only have a certain amount of money I think for trash stuff. trash is high priority. I, I would agree I, with that. Know, it's, 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 a, it's a word for it. And I can't remember the word, but I always like to tell people in um i do believe it's in one of malcolm gladwell's books he talks about how new york drastically reduced their crime in the 90s because they cleaned up the subways mm -hmm. and broken glass syndrome or something like that mm -hmm. whatever the phrase for it is and i think that a good amount of our crime comes from just when people when you look around and you see trash you're like no mm -hmm. one cares Mm -hmm. in psych a lot like I, subconsciously so the person who's in charge of you know streets and trash and all that is the mayor they needed to blast 10 mayors they need to get it together because sometimes i'm like street, driving the street was pretty aggressive up. on a lot of that cleaning vacant lots and he was uh, he's a senior advisor our, our law firm so i'm a little biased but he, uh, <laughs> and his son sharif and i got to work together it's our one who I, think, I, th awesome. I think he's amazing so i know mayor street uh, will tell you that he was he and he was aggressive with or, you know all the open air drug markets and all the vacant lots but yeah i mean you just it, need to get the trash yeah. off the street just literally yeah, it's <laughs> everywhere and it's really gross and even like bigger cities so we were in germany last year um my mom took us to visit all the um all the concentration camps. That was like her 60th birthday trip that she wanted to go on. That's like I don't know if I would do that sobering. for my birthday, but <laughs> sobering, man. Uh, <laughs> like, wow. Most people are like, I want to go to Mexico. My mom's like, we're going to Auschwitz. <laughs> my whole family's like, and when my mom, like my mom says, we're going, we're first, she wanted us to all sleep there. There's like, my mom's Buddhist. So there's like this program where like you stay there and like, it's like this healing thing. We were all like, no nope, hard pass. <laughs> like we love you mom, but hard pass. <laughs> So we went and we were in like Munich, which is like three and a half million people or three million people way big. And there was not a homeless person to be found. And there was not a, like a piece of trash anywhere. So that I mean, if 
places that are way bigger than us can can do that then we certainly new york is not as dirty dirty yeah yeah people always like boston's so clean well boston's a lot smaller right yeah, I, listen i think if you want to and also think about it, there's a lot of construction going on there's a lot of people that are not taking care of th- there's a whole bunch of i always think it's not as simple in as la looks, they have street crane cleaning yeah i don't want there's but, a, there was, was this program i think the city was looking at uh where that you can get like um you can pay homeless people and people who were i used to play the to uh, excuse this phrase stuff. i used to pay the crackhead on my block when i lived yeah before i moved here i used to pay him every week to clean up yeah just to clean up the whole block yeah because i would come outside and be like what the hell like right in front of my right in yeah. front of my door is like well maybe you should start you should quit chips. your job and start the trash cleanup <laughs> <laughs> initiative maybe you heard it here first <laughs> maybe i'm that passionate about it no i get it i mean listen who wants to walk around with the dirty city not I. So I just, it just makes people behave a certain way, well, and maybe I think the that next mayor needs to be like super tough on trash, like not tough on crime, imagine, tough on trash. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine how our home price values would go up. It just would be a nicer place to live. Period. I know. Like everything would just be a ni- be nice. We need one time I was looking at a house. I was <laughs> looking at a house, and and it's not in the best neighborhood. And so anytime I'm looking at a house and I'm trying to figure things out, I talk to the neighbors. So I just come off totally like unguarded, like, hey, how y'all doing? Like, they don't know I'm li- thinking about being invested. I'm usually bummy, like whatever. Yeah. And so I'm like, hey, what's up? So I'm talking to the guys like, what's going on in this neighborhood? And they're talking to me. They have no idea what I'm doing. So the one guy has like some potato chips or something. And he throws the trash and I flip my <laughs> lid. <laughs> Like, pick think, that up. What think, are you doing? I think you posted about this. Yes. You're like, we don't want her in the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, you should. You should wear one of those vests and just patrol the blocks. They see her coming, like, oh, shoot. I chased somebody down in my Grab car that newspaper. before. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Okay. All right. Are you when we're finished? But do you, is there anything you want? our listeners to know about you anything that you have coming up that you want people to know about or yeah I just want people to um to reach out I mean if you even if you think it's a silly question or if you um like I'm Adam my brother will say this like I will take every phone call and listen I just want to help people so it's it's nice that I have the expertise and I can actually like implement any of the suggestions I have but if people want to get in real estate, if they're working, you know, on something and they're not getting the results they want or they're not, you know, they're getting kind of logged up or jammed up with the city or anything, they can always reach out to our office. Um, I answer the phone an uncomfortable amount. And I love this. Like uh, I left my job to do this. I didn't like fall upon this. And this is like what I'm here on this earth to help with, Aww. among other other things like saving animals. That's like my biggest thing. <laughs> but um, and what do we have coming up? Um, we're doing a fundraiser. For okay. Alan Dom, mm. uh, on May eighth. Really, where? Um, it's at Cuba Libre. Are from the tickets six too expensive to for me? No, uh, fifty dollars <laughs> is the lowest. Oh. Yeah, free uh, beer and wine and food, and m- my whole idea from it. I'm doing it with one of my best friends, Jen Brown, and uh, I don't know if you ever met Jen. Mm-hmm. She's a uh, She's like one of the most organized event people. I'm like, let's do this. She's like, oh God, rein it in. But she like <laughs> makes it happen, and uh, we're doing it to support Alan number one, but I want to get more people and more millennials and younger people mm-hmm. involved in politics and especially around Alan. I mean, Alan is someone who, um, is really tapped in with the city. Um, he really has spent time dealing with millennial issues and technology and coding for kids in the school. And, you know, I, I respect all council members, you know, especially the incumbents that I get to work with. I respect all of them. You, it's easy to be critical, but I respect all of them for what they can, and, um, and do do for our city. But Alan in particular, because I got to work you know for him mm-hmm. uh, and I've gotten been really lucky to be around him he's someone that I I'll always support and so we're doing this fundraiser um and it's not for my business it's for um it's for him and for people to get out and support him and have a little bit of a younger crowd awesome. be involved and ask him questions I mean put him on the spot like people should show up and ask him questions people are like well, he, what what are we going to do about this like that's one of the people that is there to listen and he is an at-large member if he gets reelected again and he gets to affect the whole city, not just a district, he's responsible for bigger, broader issues. So so that's it. Did they um, give him a date for his um, abatement bill that he wants? They're not scheduling any of that. Oh. 
they're not scheduling any of that right now. There's a bunch of abatement bills, so they're going to be looking at it. Um, I know that the council president's office is looking at it. Um, I don't think anyone disagrees with the fact that it needs to be like evaluated and looked at, but I don't think they're going to just go with like one bill or the other. I think they're going to like look at it in more holistic and figure out because once you change that, once you like open Pandora's box with it, it's got to be done well so i know that the council president's office has been um we work a lot with them um because the fifth district has a lot of the um a lot of the projects that Mm -hmm. are going on so we work with them a lot and i know that they're looking at it um so looking at all the bills that have come up you know the council members have introduced i know uh, councilman bass introduced one Mm -hmm. and um councilman gim and allen and a couple others i think you know everyone's pretty involved with that so they're not scheduling it um, I don't think why the pro- while the primary is going on, but they are going to look at it and weigh in. on When it. I was at his office, he talked about um, he talked about he wanted to get my opinion on it, mm-hmm. and then he said, "I said, well, what do you need from me?" And he's like, "You know, basically get people to show up when I introduce my bill." And I'm mm-hmm. like, "That's easy. That's nothing." Yeah, but ask him about it and make sure you agree with it. I mean, no, I, I, we we talked we talked in depth about it. I didn't want to yeah. go on the record and say anything, yeah. but we talked in depth about it. Yeah. Um, he and I share the same sentiment about it. Yeah. I told him that his biggest problem is that most people, uh, unfortunately, all of the city council people have to basically support their constituents. Mm-hmm. But most constituents don't understand, have never taken a macroeconomics class. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they don't understand that the tax abatement helps us. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, but all they're thinking is, you know, developers are getting a free ride right yeah and it but it helps us as a whole because when we keep taxing soda tax all these taxes we're we're just recycling the same money we have to get new money in from the outside so when Mm -hmm. we're offering these tax abatement we're making us look more attractive Mm -hmm. to outside especially because we have so many taxes i mean if it would be one thing if philly had like two taxes and that was like it like you know the suburbs like you don't really need a tax abatement in like radnor where i grew up but you only you know most of their money is taken from the property tax which they have like a very high percentage of collection like the city has over half a billion dollars of delinquent real estate taxes 220 or 250 million dollars of water and sewer alone alan taught me those numbers and like but the suburbs don't have that. They're also, you know, 30,000 people. This is a different ball game. But right. I think we do need something that helps spur development. And I mean, the opportunity zone thing is great, too. Different mechanism. But, yeah, I think if you're going to make a change with the abatement, it has to be studied and well thought out. And it just can't be like off the rip. You can't right. just be like, this, this will, let's try this. Like, right. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be thought out. So th- they, there will be hearings for these. I, I would put money on that. I don't know when. Um, and I don't know what, who's to say, like whose bill is the best and not, I've not spent enough time with them to be, to give you an opinion. You will eventually. Mm-hmm. So Rachel, this was super fun. Yeah, it was. I Good learned time. a lot Good. and I know you guys did too. We went a whole hour. Wow. <laughs> so, all right guys, you always have homework. I'm going to give you some specific homework. It's really not that much different than the normal homework. Make sure you send this episode out to at least five people who have shared with you that they want to be big time real estate developers send it out to those five people if you don't know anyone who said that they want to be a big time real estate developer send it out to someone who you think would be good at being a real estate developer Mm -hmm. Um, and make sure that you subscribe on itunes go to better than success.com forward slash itunes or the google podcast Um, subscribe there better than success.com forward slash Google. Give us a five star rating and please, please, please might write us an amazing review. And so you guys until next time, happy entrepreneuring.